Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, first session for Nibosh IGC. Uh, so last week we carried out an introduction of Nibosh IGC. So uh, for the new students, let me just give a small reminder of what Nibosh IGC is. Uh, Nibosh, as we discussed last time, um, stands for the National Examination Board for Occupational Safety and Health, and it is an awarding body. And the qualification that you guys are undertaking is the International General Certificate in Occupational Safety and Health. So the full title of your course is Nibosh IGC in Occupational Safety and Health. Um, basically, Nibosh IGC has two parts. The first part, uh, which we are going to start today, uh, is known as Unit IG1. Okay, And the second part is known as Unit IG2. Now, IG1 will be assessed based on an open book examination and it will be followed up with a closing interview. The open book examination for unit IG1 is scheduled for 5th of October and at least uh, one week to 10 days after you will schedule your interviews as well. Uh, then we have unit IG2, which is a risk assessment assignment. Uh, there is no exam for IG2. You only have to prepare an assignment and that assignment will have to be submitted by the 12th of October. Okay, so these are the dates uh, and uh, basically um, the classes will be done every weekend. Uh, it will be every Sunday and Monday evening from 8 to 10 p.m. Tomorrow's class is not going to be there. We're going to do the class on Monday. The next class is going to be on Monday. A reason because a lot of students will be watching the cricket so that's why we uh, postponed their tomorrow's class um i have sent the schedule of all the classes on the group so you guys can uh, have a look at that schedule those who are new and who haven't received the schedule i'll send the schedule to you again so today we're going to start our first chapter or first element of unit one the uh, unit one total has four elements or four chapters. Um, element one, two, and element four are very brief, but element number three is very detailed and very long. So we'll spend more time on that and relative, relative, relatively less time on the other elements. So today's element or element uh, IG1, this element basically, basically discusses about the reasons for managing health and safety. So the title of this chapter is why we should manage workplace health and safety. So in this chapter, we're going to discuss the reason for man managing health and safety. The main learning objectives of this chapter or this element are number one, to discuss the moral, legal and financial reasons for managing health and safety in the workplace. Now, when you're working in the health and safety profession, Somebody might ask you, why is safety so important? Why do we need to spend money on safety? So you as a health and safety professional, you must be able to give them arguments. And these arguments should be in a professional and sustained manner to convince them why health and safety is necessary and why health and safety is important. So basically, you can discuss with them three main reasons for managing health and safety. Uh, the moral, legal, and financial reasons for managing health and safety in the workplace. Uh, we will also be able to explain how health and safety is regulated and the consequences of non-compliance. Regulation basically refers to regulation by law. Okay, so regulated by law. So usually when we want to achieve something and we want to uh, monitor something, we need to establish a law. That law is implemented and it is regulated and we will then determine the consequences of non-compliance. So if you do not comply with the law, if there is non-compliance of the law, there will be consequences. So we will discuss uh, how health and safety is regulated and what are the consequences of not following or not complying with the safety regulations. Then we will summarize the health and safety duties of different groups of people at work. So there are different people involved in the workplace. There are managers, senior managers, 
board of directors, the middle manager, supervisors. Work. So we will discuss the role and responsibilities of all of those people. Then we're also going to explain how contractors should be selected, monitored, and managed. Contractor management is very, very important. So we're going to discuss how we should select, monitor, and manage the contractors. Okay, so let's talk about uh, moral, legal, and financial reasons. So first of all, we'll talk about morals and money. We're talking about morals and money. Uh, before we get into that, we need to understand some key term, term in terms, uh, some key terminology or key definitions. First of all, we need to understand what is health. What do we mean by health? Health basically is the absence of disease or ill health. So if you are free from any sickness, if you are free from any disease, and if you do not have any ill health problems, then we can say you are healthy. So basically, when you talk about occupational health, we talk about the health hazards in the workplace, things in the workplace that can cause diseases, things in the workplace that can cause sicknesses. So in order to manage those, uh, what you call it, uh, health agents or biological agents, that aspect is related to health. Then we have safety. What do you mean by safety? Safety means absence of risk of personal injury. So if you are at risk of being physically injured, for example, if you are at risk of getting a broken bone, or if you are risk, at risk of getting a cut finger, or if you are at risk of getting laceration, it means you are unsafe. Okay? But if you are free from the risk of being cut, or if you are free from the risk of any kind of personal injury, we can say that you are safe. So health deals with ill health or uh, sorry, diseases, sicknesses, and safety deals with protection against personal injuries. Okay. So health deals with sickness and diseases. Safety de deals with personal injury. Then we have welfare. Welfare basically is the access to the basic facilities uh, to address the basic needs of people. What are the basic needs of people? The basic needs of people or human beings are, I mean, drinking water, um, having rest shelter, eating, dining, using sanitary facilities such as toilets, etc. So all of these facilities that we provide uh, in order to meet the basic needs of people they are known as welfare facilities, okay? So these are some key terminologies that you need to remember. Health, safety, and welfare. Okay, here is a question for you guys, and I want you guys to participate in this. Now, the question is, why might the management of an organization not consider health and safety to be a priority? Okay, who is going to tell me? Why do you guys think that the management of an organization may not give priority to safety? Yes, Ali. Sir, to, to be the cost, uh, you know, in, in order to be cost effective or cost cutting, they will Very not consider well because it will reduce the it will reduce the efficiency of the work because you have to follow the rules and regulations to make the productivity in a safe manner but if you are not uh, going to uh, you know uh, take care of these safety measures then you will be having a bit uh, extra productivity in your out uh, output but you will be not safe maybe due to that that is uh, the correct answer and basically that is a misconception okay now the misconception held by the management that safety is going to cost money and safety is going to hinder our progress. Okay. That misconception with the management is the reason why they don't give priority to health and safety. But as I told you, it's a misconception, which means they don't understand it properly. They don't have the appropriate awareness. Because in fact, if you manage health and safety properly, you can save a lot of money, 
Okay. For example, if an accident happens, somebody gets injured, what will happen? All the work on site will stop. Okay. So their equipment, all the equipment on the project is now idle. All the manpower on the work is now idle. So they are basically losing money. If they had spent a small amount on health and safety, they could have prevented that accident and saved those losses. Okay. So uh, that was very well answered, Ali. Uh, there is a misconception among the management that uh, safety is going to cost us a lot of money and following safety rules will be difficult and following safety rules is going to delay our progress. Um, so because of this misconception or misunderstanding or lack of awareness, that is the reason why management think it is not important and they give it a low priority. Okay, so what are the moral reasons for managing health and safety? What do you mean by moral? Moral means humanitarian, insani hamdardi. Okay, humanitarian reasons or moral reasons for managing health and safety. So basically, it is morally unacceptable to injure any workers. Now, if you are an employer and somebody is earning money for you, they are making you money. It is morally unacceptable that those people should be injured at work. Okay. When someone gets injured at work, okay, they might become disabled. Now, if someone gets disabled, they are going to lose their livelihood. Okay. They are going to uh, lose the way that they used to live. That disability to the workers, it can cause them a lot of pain and suffering and they will undergo a lot of difficulties. Now, is it fair that a person who is coming to earn money for his family, a person who is going to uh, make you money and a person who is trying to make a living for himself, is it fair that he should get injured at work? Is it fair that he should get disabled at work? There have been many accidents in the workplace in which workers have lost their legs, in which workers have lost their arms, okay, or eyesight or any other disability they have achieved at work, okay? And that disability at work, it causes them a lot of pain and suffering. It can cost them their livelihood. And they can never enjoy their life as they used to. For example, if a person, if your worker, he's working for you and he meets an accident, his both legs are amputated, he sits in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Can that worker ever play with his children again? Can that worker ever run after his children again? No. So is it fair? Do you think it is acceptable? that somebody should get injured at work? No. It is totally unacceptable. And the society expects us, all employers, society, basically, we are a human society. And uh, based on our values, based on our human values, based on our human ethics and morals, the society expects us to protect our workers when they are making money for us. And it is the right thing to do because it is our moral and ethical obligation. Also, the workers, when they, uh, I mean, in the Middle East, you can see there are many workers from all over the world. There are many workers here from uh, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China. There are people here from Africa, people here from uh, the uh, South America, from Europe from Australia, from all over the world, people come, especially here in the Middle East, to work. And most of these people, they, they are here for working. They leave their families behind in their home countries. Why? They are staying away from their families, separated from their children and wives and mothers, and, uh, and they are here to earn money for them. Do you think that they deserve to go back to their families in a coffin? Or 
do they deserve to go back in a wheelchair in a disabled form no so it is totally unacceptable that people should get injured at work it is the fundamental human right of every worker that they reach home safely to their families in one single piece and imagine what will go through i mean uh, the friends and family what will they go through when they find out that their brother or their loved one has been injured at work it will be i mean uh, hell for them so it's a moral obligation for the employers to protect the workers and whenever there is an accident there is severe pain and suffering now the person who gets injured he definitely is going to go through a lot of pain he is going to go through uh, if he if he has an injury he is going to go through pain he is going to go through suffering and he will go through mental stress so he is going through hell because he got injured at work and imagine the ang- agony of the friends and family imagine a father who goes back to his home to his children he left his home walking on both his feet and if he meets an accident in the workplace he'll go back home to his children in a wheelchair imagine the pain and suffering the children will feel when they see their father in a wheelchair coming back home is that acceptable no it is totally unacceptable so that is the moral reason for managing health and safety we have a moral obligation humanitarian obligation to protect workers who come and earn a living for their families so it is totally unacceptable that anyone should get injured and go back home in either a coffin or a wheelchair or in any other form so no kind of injury is acceptable no kind of accident is acceptable in the workplace Uh, in addition when a person gets injured if they get disabled or they get a severe injury or a fatality or if they die they lose their livelihood the person who is earning money if he is on a wheelchair he cannot work anymore so he is not going to be able to earn money he is not going to put bread on his table the families are going to lose their breadwinner how will that family survive how will they live so that is the moral reason for managing health and safety so it is totally unacceptable that people should get injured at work and it is our moral obligation to protect workers at work uh, protect workers in the workplace now there is an international organization which is part of the united nations it is known as ilo international labor organization and this is a subsidiary of the un united nations okay so ilo is a subsidiary of the united nations and the international labor organization they basically uh, work towards the protection of the labor rights they are working globally to ensure that the workers or laborers in th- uh, i mean uh, in the workplace throughout the world they uh, their rights are protected and there are adequate uh, mechanisms in place there are adequate uh, programs in place so that those workers are protected now globally these uh, statistics are gathered by ILO and as per ILO they say that more than 350000 work related fatal accidents happen each year you know there are 350000 accident every year in which people die and 2.75 million work related fatalities each year which means that there are more than uh, 2.75 million people who die at work each year 2.4 million fatalities from occupational diseases these are people who die from a disease which they acquired in the workplace they might have acquired cancer they might have acquired other diseases lung problems so many other diseases are there which you can pick up in the workplace 
and 270 million incidents, uh, sorry, accidents and 160 million diseases a year due to work. And this is worth 4% of the global GDP. So you can imagine how much uh, losses are incurred globally in terms of manpower, suffering, pain, and in terms of money as well. Okay. Now, if an employee gets injured at the workplace, um, what are the implications that accident is going to have? The implications that accident is going to have on the injured employee, the company, and the line manager. Now, the implications for the injured employee are number one, he's going to go through a lot of pain and suffering. Okay. So he might not be able to work for his life. Again, he might uh, even die. So the injured employee has a lot of implications. Then for the company, there are also a lot of implications. The company might be prosecuted. Okay. They might be taken to court. They might be penalized. They might be fined. They might receive a fine. Um, so the company also undergoes a lot of implications. What are the implications of the line manager? The line manager could be fired. He, he might lose his job. Or if he's found guilty in the court of law, he might be taken to jail as well or he might be fined by uh, the court as well. So there are so many implications uh, if an accident takes place uh, in the workplace. So we need to make sure that we do our best to protect the workers in the workplace. If we cannot provide adequate protection to the workers, the, there might be an accident and this accident can be very, very costly for the organization. Okay, so that's why there are many financial reasons for managing health and safety as well. Now, the financial reasons are very, very important. Usually, there is a misconception uh, among uh, the management, just like uh, Ali talked a while ago, that they think that they're going to waste money on safety. They're going to have to spend extra money on safety, and safety is going to cost us, and it is going to delay us, and all that, which is totally wrong. If an accident takes place, there is much more to lose. So all of these costs, they can be avoided if we invest a little bit of money in health and safety. Okay. So what are the financial reasons for managing health and safety? Number one, medical costs. So we can uh, obviously save a lot of money. Uh, if a person gets injured, they are going to uh, have to go to the hospital and they are going to uh, pay a lot of money. So if the company invests a small amount, they can save this medical cost. So this is a moral reason for managing health and safety. Work stoppage. If an accident happens, what's going to happen? The work is going to stop and the area will be barricaded. They will be investigated. And uh, at least two to three hours, there will be no work. So for those two to three hours, all the equipment in the workplace is idle. All the manpower in the workplace is idle. So the company is still paying them hourly basis. And so the company is losing money. So let's say there are 500 workers in the workplace. Okay. So 500 workers in the workplace, they don't work for, let's say, two hours. Okay. So... Per worker, how much salary is there? Let's say this is 10 dirhams per hour. Okay. 10 dirhams per hour. And uh, the workers are how many? 500 workers. So 10 into 500 is 5,000. And if the work has stopped for two hours, 10,000. So the company is going to lose 10,000 dirhams of money just for the idle manpower. Now think about the equipment. Let's say there are 100 pieces of equipment in the workplace. Each equipment, let's say it has an hourly rate of 100 dirhams. Okay. So 100 into 100 is 10,000. And for two hours, 20,000. So you've lost around 40 or 50,000 dirhams in just two hours. And that is just the work stoppage cost. Other costs are separate. You are still going to have to pay medical costs. You're going to have to pay hospital treatment. 
if the person if the injured person gets a serious injury you might have to go to the hospital you might need surgery so there are hospital treatment cost as well the hospital is going to admit him you have to pay for the room room charges treatment charges surgery medicine so many costs are involved in that as well then if the injured person decides to sue the company and it's his legal right to do that he might go and say that because of this company because of their negligence i have lost my legs and i have lost my livelihood i cannot make money i cannot survive anymore i cannot support my family so the court uh, the case will be taken to the court and the worker will be given compensation okay now if the uh, case goes to the court the employer has going to go uh, and pay the court fees then if investigation is carried out there is going to be money spent on the investigation the person who is injured you need to hire a replacement for that injured person that is going to cost money you have to pay for his visa you have to pay for his medical insurance uh, emirates id this that uh, so many costs are involved in that as well so replacement of worker is going to cost money and training of the replacement workers if the worker was a highly trained worker or highly skilled worker they need a lot of training so if there is a crane operator is going to need to have uh, uh, all kinds of uh, crane operating training and uh, lifting safety training so there is a lot of training fee required a lot of money required for retraining that person then once you are in the court the court might decide to impose a penalty on you they might fine you that's another financial burden on your company then if you are found negligent it means negligent means you did not fulfill your obligations you did not fulfill your legal or moral obligations that means you will have to pay compensation to the injured person as well okay then there could be loss of future business so if the word goes out in the market that this company is injuring workers and they are not protecting their workers obviously that is going to be very very bad for the company reputation and the company is going to lose a lot of business as well so loss of future business is a huge cost and this is a cost which you cannot measure maybe next year you are about to get a project worth 2 billion dirhams but because of that accident the company was going to award you that project they're going to think they're going to say if these guys are killing people then we will not award them the project so you might lose billions of dirhams uh, just because of a mismanagement of health and safety so the financial reasons they can be direct and indirect so basically accidents and ill health uh accidents and ill health they can be uh, very very costly and the cost might be direct it might be indirect direct cost will basically the measurable cost arising directly from accidents so any kind of cost which is directly arising from the accident and you can measure that cost that cost is known as direct cost then there is indirect cost indirect cost arises as a consequence of the event but may not directly involve money and it is often difficult to quantify direct costs include the medical cost the property damage okay the hospital treatment okay indirect cost is related to loss of labor loss of productivity fines penalties um uh, loss of future business so all of these are indirect costs so health and safety failures can affect the broader economy as well as well as individual companies as well then there are some costs which you can insure against and some costs which you cannot insure against okay so insurance is very very important if you don't want to lose your money you need to carry out the proper insurance and insurance sometimes uh, they will ask for a lot of things related to your accident records so uh, there are insured costs and there are uninsured costs as well what are the costs that you can insure you can insure the fire damage cost so if there is a fire in the workplace and the property is damaged that can be uh, insured work worker injury or death that can be insured so you can have a life insurance for the workers that life insurance if the person dies you will be paid his life insurance money as well then the medical cost they can, this can be insured like in uae you can see that every uh, employee 
must have a uh, what you call it medical insurance that's a legal requirement so you, the, the medical insurance that is a medical cost as well that is insured cost then we have uninsured cost uninsured costs include loss of raw material due to accidents uh, so if there is any material which is lost because of an accident that is uninsured cost sick pay if a person gets sick uh, he definitely for uh, the first 45 days he needs to be paid so 15 days will be will be full and the remaining 30 days will be half uh, pay so sick pay will be awarded to that person as well overtime uh, you might have to spend money working overtime that's an uninsured cost uh, equipment repairs you cannot insure any uh, cost related to that lost material so if there is a uh, tanker or uh, carrying diesel and it is spilled that diesel cannot be insured against you cannot claim any cost against that diesel as well so these are the uh, two types of costs there are insured costs and uninsured costs insured costs are those that can be insured by an insurance company uninsured costs cannot be insured by the company okay so uh, there are uh, various what you call it uh, samples given here uh, for direct costs and indirect costs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this as an assignment so you guys can do this. Next is regulating health and safety. Uh, regulating health and safety is very, very important as well because most countries have health and safety laws in their workplace. Okay. So health and safety laws, they exist to make sure that uh, the workers, they are protected in the workplace. If you don't achieve the legal requirements, if you fail to achieve minimum legal requirements, that can lead to prosecution and prosecution can be very, 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 very dif dif difficult for the company. Okay, so we discussed earlier about ILO. ILO is the International Labor Organization, which uh, provides uh, labor standards uh, at an uh, international level. They are an agency or a subsidiary of the United Nations. And most of the countries, they are members of the ILO. Um, and basically, they set international standards regarding workplace health and safety in the form of conventions and recommendations. Conventions are mandatory and recommendations are not mandatory. Now, conventions create binding obligations or policies to implement their provisions. However, there is no legal authority unless ratified by the member state into its own legal structure. This is very, very important to understand. International labor organization, they will set health and safety standards, okay? But it is up to the signatory country to accept it or not, okay? Once they accept it, they'll have to include it as part of their law and that uh, becomes very, very tangible. Then recommendations, recommendations provide guidance on the policy, legislation and best practice and they are uh, not mandatory. The two important, uh, I mean, uh, uh, convention and recommendation we need to remember for this paper is the OSHAD, uh, sorry, uh, is the ILO Convention on Health and Safety, which is known as C-155, which is a goal-setting policy for companies and nations. And we also have an Occupational Health and Safety Recommendation 1981 R-164, and this supplements the uh, Convention C-155 as well. Okay, guys, next topic is employer responsibility, but this is a very, very important topic. So what we'll do now is we'll take a small break, okay? And uh, we will be back in 15 minutes. You can click on the same link after 15 minutes and rejoin the session. So let's take a break and we will start the session again at 20 minutes past 9, okay? So it's 9.05 now. I will see you guys at 9.20. Okay. So please, uh, you can click the link again at 9.20 and we will uh, let you in again. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, sir. Okay. So see you guys in 15 minutes. <laughs> 